So, uh, years ago when I first started off, I was accepted at the medical school. I was going to become a medical doctor. I got a good score on, on, on the MCAT, Medical Collegiate Aptitude Test. And uh, I won't mention the name of the medical school I was accepted into by the very prestigious and uh, osteopathic school. And then I went to the chiropractic school, and the secretary wasn't there that day. And this old guy showed me around for about two hours. I'm going, who is this old guy? Well, he was the president of the school. And he took me around. He was a Mormon, really good man, and tried to convince me to become a chiropractor. Now, a chiropractor fixed my back when I got out of the Army, and they wanted to operate on me. Actually, they wanted to uh, uh, amputate my leg because I have such damage to the discs in my back that the leg shriveled up and I was dragging behind like I'm dragging now with the car accident that I had. And I went to a chiropractor in Chicago uh, and he says, why don't you, he took x-rays, he says, why don't you let me work on it for a couple months. So the first time he adjusted me, I thought he broke my back because I heard some snap in there. <laughs> and I got scared, I go, I'm not going back to that guy. So it was like Friday, he said, come back on Monday. So I go, I ain't going back to that guy. So, but then on Sunday, I felt like electricity going down my leg. I go, well, maybe he's doing something. So I don't have any alternative. So I went to him for a number of months, and my leg came back. So when I went to the chiropractic school, it turned out that the president's best friend was this guy. They went to school together. So I took that as, with Casey readings, I took that as a message from God that I should become a chiropractor. Plus, I didn't want to be under the thumb of the pharmaceutical companies. You understand? Because what does a medical doctor do? He diagnoses and he gives drugs, right? Mm -hmm. So as a chiropractor, under the auspices of my doctor's license, I can do a lot of stuff. I take my own x-rays, diagnose my own x-rays, I can do acupuncture, I can take blood, I can do nutritional counseling. Um, Physiotherapy uh, is more interesting to me. So that's what we got there. Now, Ron, which one of these is most accurate? Six to ten percent, seven to ten percent, or eight to ten percent? I'm sorry. Six. Yeah. <laughs> Six tenths, seven tenths, or eight tenths of living thing of all living things are composed of water. Which one of those is most accurate? Uh, I'll say seven. It's either seven or eight. Okay, I don't know the answer to that. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> it's seven. Doug Bradley helped me out with that. <laughs> okay. Say so seven tenths of all living things contain water. So your body is seven tenths water. So if you give it water, then you're doing it a favor. A lot of people say, do not drink steam distilled water because it will leach minerals out of your body. But I don't find it to be so. There's distilled water in plants. Now, what plants do is they take the minerals out of the soil and they chelate them. They attach them to a carbon molecule so that you can absorb them. If you take minerals without being chelated, meaning being organic, you can't absorb any of those minerals. So, one time my friend took me to a tour of the water filtration plant. And I seen stack 10, 20 feet high going out for I don't know how long, a mile. These look like pieces of rock. And I go, what are those? He goes, those are pills that people have taken, uh, uh, pharmaceutical pills or nutraceutical pills that the body didn't digest. And they crapped out into the toilet mm -hmm. and it went into the supply. Mm -hmm. and this, this, is, this is where it ends up. It was like millions, billions of dollars worth of product that were absorbed and digested. So the thing is, when you get things that are, unless you're using herbs as, as, as your medicine, um, when you get things that are processed in a factory, it's usually doing yourself a disservice. If you eat things that are alive, you'll be alive. And if you eat things that are dead, you'll be dead. Almost nothing on the face of the earth eats things that are dead, except for scavengers, like vultures and lobsters and stuff like this. Everything, all the animals prefer alive food, and so should you. 
a human being is the only thing that cooks everything. I have mostly Polish patients, the Polish patients. I said, you need to eat more vegetables. I do. Like what? Cooked carrots, cooked sauerkraut. Are you cooking too much? Well, I, I can't eat it raw. Why not? I try to get them for dinner to have fish, chicken, lamb, the lighter proteins or shrimp or something like that, and sliced vegetables with some salt or pepper or some seasoning. Sliced tomatoes, avocado, lettuce leaves, but it's like, to them, it's like living in a parallel universe. I'm on some bizarre world where I got a plate full of sliced raw vegetables on this side, and I got meat on this side, and where's the potatoes? And where's the bread? <laughs> now, bread has more energy in it than you think, has more energy in it than you need. As you get older, you need a lot less food than you think, only you need food that's concentrated with energy, concentrated with enzymes and minerals and vitamins. That's what you need. You don't need, if you're eating nothing but bread, your body kind of recognizes it as a wheat product, but it doesn't totally recognize it because it doesn't have those buffers that a regular plant would have it. Your DNA recognizes plants because your ancestors were eating plants, grains, that it recognizes. Pop-tart snow. Pop-tart snow. Maybe a little. No, pop-tart snow. <laughs> so, what do they serve in gulags and in Siberia and in prisons? What are they serving in the movies? Well, they serve you when you're in prison. Bread and water. Soup. Who said chicken soup? I said soup. Bread and soup. I'm putting you in prison later. Now let me survive on that. <laughs> bread and water. Why bread and water? Because there's a lot of energy in the bread. Because there's a tremendous amount of energy in flour. Flour is starch. Starch is compacted sugar. You understand? So one slice of bread can keep you going for five days. Okay? For me, one slice of bread will keep me going for one day because of the tremendous amount of energy my brain exudes at <laughs> night when I'm thinking about things. So one day for me, five days for you. So what does that mean? Is cut down on everything that's white except cauliflower and you'll be doing yourself a service. And later on, I'll show you my product for cleaning out the colon, and we'll talk about uh, more about cleaning out the, the liver. Now, let me see. Hmm. The chlorophyll molecule in green plants, spinach or arugula. I like to talk about spinach or wheatgrass because it's really green. The chlorophyll molecule is a complex molecule. If I, had it here, I draw it out for you, and it looks almost exactly like the hemoglobin molecule. Hemoglobin and chlorophyll look almost exactly the same, except that the hemoglobin has an iron chain on it, and the chlorophyll has, I believe, a magnesium chain on it. Some people believe that when you drink green juices uh, or eat green food products, the body takes that chlorophyll molecule and just changes it into hemoglobin, like a blood transfusion. And I've seen some evidence that it could be true, but no one quite knows for sure. Now, the funny thing about plants. They've taken plants and they measured the soil, or they've taken a seed, and measured how many minerals and vitamins were in the seed, or enzymes, They've taken the soil, and they know how many minerals are in the soil. Maybe you've got nitrogen, potassium, maybe you've got uh, 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 phosphorus in the soil. They know how much is in there. They'll plant the seed, they'll water it, check the water, make sure uh, what's the mineral content in the water. The plant will grow, and when they cut the plant down and they examine it, that plant will have silver, gold, platinum, rubidium, manganese in it. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? No one knows. That would mean that the plant is an alchemist. It can change one element into another element, which scientists says is impossible, but yet the plant does it. I got a better one. They've taken chickens, and they've fed them 
what I feed the patient for mending bone, which I'm taking for my shoulder, and nobody asked, but I tripped over a toe line and dislocated and fractured my shoulder. So just to stop anybody from later saying, hey, what happened to your shoulder? Tripped over a toe line. So I take shave grass. Shave grass is high in silicon. My teacher, Dr. John Christopher, a famous herbalist, said that the body will take the silicon from shave grass and transmute it into calcium. Well, he learned that from Dr. Shook and Dr. Shook from Dr. Coffin and Dr. Coffin from Father Sebastian Niep or Niep in Austria. And when I heard this, I didn't believe it because there's no such thing supposedly as a transmutation from one element in another element unless you've got a cyclotron. But they fed the chickens the shade grass and they discovered that the eggshells started getting three times the amount of calcium. And they presented it to the scientists and the scientists, well, it can't be transmutation. It's got to be that the chickens are taking the calcium from their own bones and making the eggshells. But when they checked the chicken's bones out, the chicken's bones were stronger and bigger too. So nobody knows how that's possible. Why is that possible? We do know that silicon speeds the absorption of calcium, but where's the calcium coming from? Nobody knows this. Now, how many quarts of water does the body give off in one day? Ron? I knew you were going to say that. Um, I don't know, four? For what? Quarts? No, two quarts of water two. a day. Through perspiration in urine and a little bit of water out the butt when you're ex extruding fecal matter. Uh, do you, you notice I, I'm withholding the urge to say crap? Well, you've said it many times. Okay. You just don't remember. Okay. Now, if you're getting rid of two quarts of water, then you need to take in two quarts of water. But you don't want to take two quarts of coffee in because the caffeine alkaloid is a water stealer. It needs water to be processed. Okay? And that would be hard on the kidneys. So, if you would drink juices, and you make the juices yourself, you could buy them in a store, but like I said, that's already processed, and that's, that's already subjected to pasteurization, light, hot, and cold. It would be best to make them yourself. And I guarantee you that if you made the juices for yourself, within a week, you'd be feeling better. And I'm going to give you a formula right now. Those of you who have pencils, lucky you. Those of you who don't, don't call my office. I'm not giving it a second time. We have some pencils across the way I can get for anybody who needs one. Does anybody need a pen? Mm -hmm. You might trouble. Okay, everybody's loaded up with a pen? I've used this on all kinds of problems, including very, very, very serious problems. Okay? Here's the formula. 70% carrot juice. Somebody's shaking their head like they know where I'm going with this, probably because she's already got that formula. Per cup, for 8 ounces, handful of spinach. One half of a small yellow onion. One stalk of celery. And if you want a piece of an apple for taste, for those of you who need that sweet taste going. The carrot juice is excellent for liver problems. I had a guy who had a patient who was suffering from a severe liver problem and he was geared up for a liver transplant. And I told him, you know, he goes, all I want you to do is to keep me alive until they can find a liver for me. And I said, you're, you're, you're kind of old. They're going to give all the livers that are available to a young person because that's what they do. He says, well, whatever you can tell me, keep me alive. You know, just give me some nutritional advice. I said, okay, I want you to start cleaning out the colon, and I want you to do this and do that. He says, I can't do that. That's too much for me. I says, but you're like dying. He goes, I know myself. Even if I'm dying, 
I can't do that much. So I told him something else to do, and he said, I can't do that, Dr. Kologia, I can't do that. I said, well, you know, what can you do? Can you do one thing? He goes, yeah, I can do one thing. I told him, I want you to drink a gallon of carrot juice a day. <laughs> he says, a gallon? He goes, you know which is a gallon? He didn't quite know how I, Well, first of all, I knew he wasn't going to drink a gallon. You tell him a gallon, he'll drink half a gallon, maybe. You tell him half a gallon, he's going to drink a quarter of a gallon. That's the, that's the nature of the human spirit. So I told him a gallon. So the next day, his son comes in. He says, my father's really worried about his condition. He says... Did, did you tell him a cup a day? I said, I told him a gallon a day. He says, how's he going to drink a gallon a day? I said, I don't care. He said, he can do one thing. I'm giving him one thing to do. He says, what if he gets three quarters of a gallon? I said, if he gets three quarters of a gallon, let him get three quarters of a gallon. He goes, what about half a gallon? I go, now you're negotiating with him. <laughs> you know? So then the next day, his grandson comes in. My father and my grandfather are so worried they're... They're getting things confused. You know what? I said, it's a gallon. <laughs> or three quarters of a gallon. He goes, do you know how many carrots we'd need for that? I said, I don't care. He said, we'd have to go to Costco and buy crates and crates of carrots. I said, I don't care. So, they sent me a picture through the email. They have the carrots stacked up to the ceiling. Said, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, he started drinking the carrots. I don't know if it was two months or three months later, he turned orange. So his medical doctor goes, hypervitaminosis A, hypervitamin, you're killing him. Oh, I'm killing him, or his, his liver problem's killing him. He says, I'm turning orange. I said, I don't care. That's the beta carotene turning you orange. So finally, I couldn't believe it. They found, they found a liver for him. And he went to the hospital, and he got a biopsy, and they told him, you don't need it. You're okay. <clears throat> so he was happy. He moved to California and he bought a farm and he started a carrot farm. And every Christmas he sent me a crate of carrots. <laughs> and uh, he said, Mer uh, Merry Christmas to the carrot doctor. <laughs> but for the last five years I don't have any carrots. So I'm kind of angry about that. Okay. Now, Plants have energy. White flour, white sugar doesn't have energy. I remember maybe 20, 25 years ago, I, I think it was National Geographic. I was reading the National Geographic, and the cover was split into four pieces. And at the top it said, Holy Spirit Lights of North America. So I says, you know, what's that? And what it is, what it was, it was different places in America that had ghostly lights that you could see at night. Sometimes in cemeteries, sometimes in marshes. And I was interested, you know, lights would appear and then move, and they had the pictures, and then would disappear. So what interested me is one was in the swamps of Louisiana or the Florida Everglades, and but there was one in Illinois. It was in Midlothian. It was in Bachelors Grove Cemetery, which was an old cemetery, mm -hmm. the 1800s. So I, I, I got my crew up, my buddies, you know, and I said, let's go down there and take some infrared uh, film and some uh, ultraviolet film and tape recorder and go see if we can catch some spooks. So we're looking for this place. We couldn't find this place. And finally I asked one of the locals. He goes, well, you got to go up a ways a bit and you got to turn left and go through these bushes. I go, through the bushes? He goes, yeah, there's a little bush. It's kind of cute spot there. Just run that bush right over. I'm going, I don't know. So we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So finally, my friend says, let's just run that bush over and see what happens. So we're going down this windy road, and the mist is rolling in. Mist is rolling in. And we see a glint of light. And we, you know, I don't know what that was. That was pretty scary. We got out of the car, got all the camera and everything. We stayed there all night long waiting for some Holy Spirit lights to appear. But no Holy Spirit lights appeared, but a lot of beer disappeared. <laughs> so the next day, when the sun was coming out, you could see that a lot of the gravestones were vandalized and they were sunken in because they were that long and everything like this. And then I, I didn't think too much about it, except the next day we went to breakfast, we talked to some of the local people, and they said, it's there, we've seen it. 
because I've seen it. It looks like a firefly, and it goes from one spot to the other spot, kind of like in an arc, and disappears, and goes from the other spot to the other spot, and it disappears. And I didn't think any more uh, about it until the 1990s, when they discovered what it is. And what do you think it was? Who's got a guess? Energy of some kind. Ah, yes, energy. But from where? Land. What? Plants. You, plants. You know this. Oh, I told you this a hundred times. <laughs> plants. The plants are talking to each other. Oh. The plants are communicating with each other. At a certain time, when the sun goes down or the sun goes up, the ionosphere has got putting some charge of some sort in the atmosphere, and the plants are sending, sending packets of light to each other. So they put a lead foil around one plant and put a polygraph on that plant and on the other plants, and the plant starts going crazy, the polygraph, when it can't communicate with the other plants. And the other plants start getting worried too. So, a famous physicist, Dr. Papp, my favorite physicist, except for Hutchinson, who's got an anti-gravity machine now. Uh, a doctor, uh, not, not Papp, Dr. Pop. He, uh, his student wanted to get a PhD under him, and he says, we have studies now that plants communicate with each other sending packets of light and water fleas communicate with each other sending the packets of light to each other. I'll give you your PhD if you can tell me can human beings, do human beings send packets of light to each other? And the guy said absolutely not. He says, well prove it one way or the other and I'll give you your PhD. Now the student was a brilliant guy. He invented what they call the photon multiplier which you can put yourself in the darkest room or 50 feet underground in a coal mine, if there's any photons down there, it'll detect it. And he found out he was wrong. Human beings communicate with each other by sending packets of light to each other. If I get close to June, or to Steve, well, I'm not going to get close to Steve, get close to June, and send pack, we're sending packets of light to each other. And here's the most interesting thing. The more you get along with the person, the less number of packets of light you send. Because the electromagnetic field that goes out from me to infinity and hers goes out to infinity, connecting all of us together is sending information via that method. Okay? When you have plants, even if you get them at the store, you know, carrot, you plant them in the ground, they'll grow. Potato, you plant them in the ground, they'll grow, right? A lot of the stuff you buy at the store, if you plant it in the ground, it will grow. It's got seeds. The seeds are alive. It's got nourishment around it. Those vegetables, those fruits, are exuding an electromagnetic field of communication with you. When you make juice out of them and you drink the juice, the living energy, you could call it pranic energy, the living energy of the juice adds to your electric field. Now, I've done experiments like this. Everybody is walking around with shoes. The shoes' bottoms were made of rubber at one time. Now they're a composite of rubber and other things. That means you're insulated. You're grounded. Only the human being is walking around with insulation at the bottom of their feet. All the other animals are not insulated. That means if you take your shoes off and you step on the grass or the dirt, the energy field around your body expands. It expands because you're becoming like an energy, you know, like a battery. Okay? So, negative energy coming in, what's the, from above or from below? Reaching up, so, from above? No, I'm not sure myself. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> Neg negative energy coming, what? The negative is from the earth. Thank you. Are you sure? Yeah, because when you're grounded, you receive those negative ions. And the more the higher you go, the more positive the atmosphere is. Okay, I'm going to take Josh at that. I get those confused sometimes. So negative energy coming up from the earth, positive energy coming from the atmosphere, turning your body into a battery so that it starts at the feet and works its way up with a double sine wave, which is like kundalini energy. Mm -hmm. Kundalini, chakras. Okay? You want to increase your energy field? Stand on the earth. You want to increase it more? 
stand on the top of the Empire State Building or a skyscraper, but you have to hold on to something that will ground you. Now if you go into your basement, there's a strip of metal or a wire going from your fuse box to the water pipe. And if you cut that, what will happen? I know all the women know this one. What happens, Josh? Electrocuted. No, the ground. If you cut the ground, oh. nothing works in your house. Nothing works. Because the light bulb will not work unless you got a negative and positive pole. You need the ground. You need to, be, you need to ground it. There are physicists that don't believe that the electricity is coming from the generators into your house doing anything. They think it's coming from the ground and being drawn up the lines to the generators and that's what's causing the energy. Now, lightning. If you stand outside and do some lightning in the distance and it's getting ready to rain, okay? There's some lightning in the distance, the electrical charge is going through the sky and it's making the particulate matter fall out of the water vapor in the clouds and it's turning into distilled water, if you want to call it steam distilled water, distilled water, the real distilled water, but the problem is on the way down it's picking up garbage, it's picking up gas and poisons in the atmosphere, okay? So this, they used to collect the rainwater and wash their baby's hair with it and drink it and everything. We can't do that anymore. But if you're standing outside, and if there's lightning in the distance and thunder, there's an electrovalent charge coming through the air. If you take your shoes off and you're standing on the ground, you're absorbing this charge and the energy field around your body is expanding. Now, you don't want to be out standing in the field because the lightning might do you some bad. But here's the interesting thing about lightning, and maybe except for Josh and June, not too many people know that lightning doesn't strike you from the heavens, it strikes you from the ground up. Lightning comes from the ground up. It finds the tallest thing and it sends negative ions all the way up and the positive ions from the, from the cloud stair steps down like this at one-seventh the speed of light or one-sixth the speed of light coming down until it meets that and then you get the electric shock. Lee Trevino, the golfer, explains how he got hit by lightning. First he said everything around him got real quiet. Then he couldn't breathe and there was no sound. Then he started felt himself being lifted in the air, lifted in the air by the ions coming from out of the earth. And then all of a sudden there was a like that and he was laying on the ground and people were tending to him. Now, what do you think the record is for somebody getting hit by lightning? How many times? Seven. More. More. Twelve. Seven. More. Seventeen. Correct. How do you know that? Brian? I don't know. <laughs> so obviously you see a man's memory could be impaired by being hit seven times, seventeen times by lightning. It's a forest ranger. Forest ranger. He says he could be in a crowd of people taller than him, trees taller than him, the lightning still finds him. He's <laughs> lost his sense of smell, some of his hearing. He's a little slow, and I don't, think, I don't know if he's looking forward to number 18 or not. <laughs> but, there's a, there's, so this, when you ground yourself, you're increasing your vitality, your life energy, your pranic energy, if you might, your kundalini, your spiritual energy. But you don't have to go outside to do it. You can take a plug on an extension cord, and the two that go in, and the third one on the bottom, the round one, that's the ground. Okay? That goes down and is connected to your water pipe in the basement. You can cut those other two off, just plug that round one into the socket, take the other end of the cord, snip it, pull out the wire, attach it to an alligator clip that you can get from uh, Radio Shack, and clip it onto a metal plate or a carbon plate and put your feet, when you're sitting in a chair reading, put your feet on it without the socks and you're grounding yourself. You're increasing the energy field around your body. Now there's books written on this. You can go on uh, uh, Amazon.com and you can get books written by medical doctors. 